Today we're giving you tips on ISO performance on your cameras and how to use an on-camera flash to create beautiful, natural-looking portraits. Hey there, and welcome to Flurn Q&A. My name is Aaron Nace, and you can find me on flurn.com, where we make learning fun, and we're answering your questions on Photoshop, photography, Lightroom, post-processing, generally anything in the creative process. So if you've got a question for me and the Flurn team, just leave it in a comment right down below. And if we choose to answer your question, you could win a free month of Flurn Pro. That's every pro tutorial we've ever made, Lightroom presets, Photoshop actions, all kinds of wonderful stuff, all in one roof. So without further ado, let's get into this week's questions. How exactly does ISO or noise ruin a picture? And how much ISO leads to too much noise? And what's unusable? Basically what ISO does is it increases the light sensitivity of the sensor inside your camera. And as a general rule, the higher your ISO goes, the more noise you're gonna have in your photo. So your goal most of the time is gonna be keeping that ISO as low as possible to reduce noise in your photos. Now, this may require shooting in an environment that has a lot of light or using external flashes. If you're in a situation that really just does not have that much light, well, you're going to need to raise that ISO level to get a proper exposure, and you're gonna have some noise in your photo. Now, not all cameras are equal here. The amount of noise that's introduced into your photos from using a high ISO is going to change from camera to camera. Generally, a newer camera and a more expensive camera will introduce less noise into that photograph. So here I've got a Canon 5D Mark III, which I feel totally comfortable shooting at ISO 800. This is a Canon T4i, and ISO 800 is going to look a lot more noisy on this camera. Now, to test the amount of noise that's going to be in your photos, you can do what's known as a lens cap test. Basically, you just keep the lens cap on your camera and take a series of photos at different ISO levels. So you can bring those photos into your computer and see how much noise is being introduced into your photos at different ISO levels. Now, when it comes to ISO noise ruining an image, honestly, this is totally subjective. For instance, if I'm shooting high-end product photography, they don't want any noise in those photos. But if we're shooting lifestyle, people hanging around a campfire, a little bit of noise in those photos doesn't really matter that much. So I personally don't focus so much on whether that noise is going to ruin my photos. Just make sure I capture a great photo. It's got a little bit of noise in there. It's totally okay. I'm working on building another computer. What's the best way to copy all the brushes, effects, and presets that I've collected over the years? So in Photoshop, you'll want to go to Edit, down to Presets, and over to your Preset Manager. This is where Photoshop stores all of your presets, including your gradients, your brushes, everything that you've created in Photoshop. So the key here when you're going to migrate from an old computer to a new computer is go ahead and save out or export these presets. It's going to put these in individual files that you can then email yourself or send over however you want, and then you'll double click on them and it'll bring your exports of presets back into Photoshop. In the preset manager, this is basically where everything is stored. So you can load new presets in here and you can export or save out your existing presets. I hesitate to buy a pen tablet for Photoshop. Is it really more comfortable and convenient than an optical mouse? Else, is Wacom still the best brand to recommend today? So if you've seen a couple of Florin episodes, you've probably noticed me using one of these. This is a pressure sensitive tablet and this one's made by Wacom. There's a link right down below where you can see the exact one that I recommend. Basically, wherever you move this pen on this tablet, it basically correlates to the cursor on your screen. So it's kind of like a mouse. Now, when you think about a mouse, you have an on and an off switch. You either have a click or a not click. This guy has 2,048 levels of pressure sensitivity. The harder I push onto the tablet, it's going to create different types of effects in my photographs. And this gives you a ton more control when you're editing your images. So when I first started using these pressure sensitive tablets, it definitely took a little while for me to get used to them. Now I've been using them for a while. And honestly, I would not go back the other way. It's like if you're painting a picture, it's like a mouse is like a rock. Like you put some paint on a rock and you like poof, poof, poof. That's kind of like a mouse and a tablet is kind of like a really nice paintbrush where you can vary your brush size and shape and stroke and pressure and all that. It's just going to give you a much more natural feel on your canvas, which is going to result in a better edited photo. So if you're considering buying one of these tablets, there are a few different price points to consider. This one is an Intuos Pro Small. Uh, I believe it's around $200 and I'm totally happy with these. Honestly, I don't personally use these buttons here on the side. I just set mine up to where I'm just using a small portion of my screen. So I would go with a totally small one 
it's gonna save you some money and do everything that you need. So that's my advice, but obviously everyone's workflow is gonna be a little bit different. I'm a little worried about other people stealing or taking credit for my images from the web. What are some measures besides a watermark that I can help take to prevent this? Honestly, there's nothing you can do to keep people from stealing your images. Thieves are thieves and they're gonna figure out a way to steal it. So to prove that an image is yours, you wanna be sure you're entering your copyright information into the metadata of that photo. And you can do this in Lightroom when you import your photos. So be sure to create a Lightroom preset upon importing a metadata preset and go ahead and enter your copyright information. That way, if someone does steal that photo, you can say, hey, look at this. I'm gonna look at my copyright information in this photo, which you can just get back into by loading that image back into Lightroom. This image is owned by me, it is copyrighted, and then you can take whatever action you feel is necessary. When it comes to delivering your photos to your clients, never, ever, ever deliver full-size images to your clients until they've paid you in full. Because if you send over your proofs and they're full-size images that they could totally use, what's to stop them from not paying you and just using those photos? There's not really much you can do. So they're not gonna be able to do much with the image that's like, you know, 400 by 400 pixels or something like that. So that's gonna be your proof round. And once they've paid you in full, that's when you can send over your full size images. What's a great technique to use on camera flash for events or indoor pictures, but still maintain a natural look? So when it comes to on-camera flash, really you've got a few different options, and this is gonna be based on what camera you're shooting. So our first category comes with flashes that are built into the cameras. I'll just get the camera and a flash. So we've got an iPhone here. Obviously we got a little flash built into the camera on that one. We have an Instax camera, this type of style where the flash is built in right over here. And here we have a Canon T4i, and we have a little flash that kind of pops up. Now here you do have the control of how much brightness you'd like to come out of the flash, but you really don't have positioning control. So that's our relatively limited category. For our next category, we're looking at cameras like this. This is a Canon 5D Mark III and it does not have an included flash in the camera itself. There's nothing that pops up. There's no way to have a flash on this camera unless you add an external flash. And that's what this hot shoe at the top is for. So here we have an external flash. This is a Canon 600 EXRT, and it just simply connects here at the very top. And now we have an external flash on this camera. This option, while it is a little bit more bulky, it's a little bit more pricey because you got to buy this thing as well. But once you start bouncing your flash, either you're going to bounce it towards the ceiling or maybe off towards a wall or something like that, then your light is going to bounce off that wall and create a very large light source and then bounce back towards your subject. So instead of having a really small light source that's just blinding right at your subject, you have a nice broad light source that's going to make your subject look a lot more natural. So the real key to using an on-camera flash and making that light look natural is making it basically look like the light isn't coming from the camera itself. So if you're using one of these with a non-camera pop-up flash, you're gonna be relatively limited, but as a positive note, even on an inexpensive camera like this T4i, most of these are going to have a hot shoe. So you can add an external flash and you're gonna get a lot more options for bouncing light with an on-camera flash. Last question. I wanna know how to make the most aesthetic looking grain for vintage-like and folk style photos. So adding grain or noise is a popular effect for making photos look a little bit older. And you can do this in Photoshop, you can do this in Lightroom, and you can do this in Capture One. So in Photoshop, you simply go to the noise filter and down to add noise. And you have a few different options for the size and roughness that you'd like to create this noise. In Lightroom, it's gonna be in your develop module and you've got basically the same options. Now, both Photoshop and Lightroom basically allow you to create one type of noise in your photograph, so they're okay. Really Capture One excels here because you can use multiple different types of grain in your photographs. The last way you can do this is to use a texture that contains noise and simply add it as an overlay to your photographs. So whichever method you use, you're gonna have a few different options. And keep in mind, you can mix and match different grain and noise styles to create your own unique noise print. All right, guys, that's it for this week's question. Thank you so much for everyone who asked. If you have a question about Photoshop, Lightroom, anything to do with post-processing or photography, be sure to leave it in a comment right down below. And if we choose to answer your question, you get a free month of Flurn Pro. How cool is that? It's incredibly cool. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you next time. All righty taking credit for my images on the web. Damn you, train. You're ruining my train of thought. Maybe you'll have some more buttons, some more custom custom-ability. That's not a word.
squanch that one. Yeah, just squanched it. Just a, just a squanch. Just a squanching. 